Correct. So I'm here with Merrick Ginsburg of Green Arrow Pest Solutions in Phoenix, Arizona. Merrick, just want to, again, thank you for taking the time to join me here on a quick call and, and talk about your experience in the pest control world. So I'd like to give you the opportunity to introduce yourself, introduce your company, and, and tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and, and how you got where you got today. Yeah. First off, thank you so much for having me on the podcast. I'm really excited about it. And I'll be honest, I'm especially more excited for uh, the follow-up podcast that we're going to do. Uh, my name is Mayo Ginsburg. I own Green Arrow Pest Solutions. I accidentally fell into the world of pest control. I moved to Arizona from Israel to start a firearms training business. But because I didn't have a lot of money, I needed to find a full-time job to support me. And pest control was the first job that I found that you actually didn't need a degree because I was looking for $50,000 jobs, no degree. And so I applied, I started working for pest control. I worked for a pest control company, took a break, worked as a locksmith, worked for a wildlife company. And then I, I decided to do my own thing. That's uh, that's awesome, and quite a jump from firearms training to to pest control. That's that's really interesting. What uh, I, I know, you said you were looking for looking for those jobs with no degree, it, it, and you said pest control was the first one that you did. You mentioned going into locksmith and going into wildlife. Wildlife is an interesting one that I'd like to ask you about because we've got a lot of people who in the pest control world. There's a lot of overlap. What did you find that you liked or didn't like when thinking about wildlife or working? in wildlife as compared to pest control? So I saw the job as a wildlife technician posted up on Indeed. And so I was looking to get back into the world of pest control after the locksmithing didn't pan out. And I looked in the job description. I thought, oh, this would be really cool. We're dealing with animals, hands-on, troubleshooting. I'm a, I'm a very hands-on guy. I like working with my tools. I like figuring problems and I thought there would be a bit more like big game maybe working with some some of the larger cats that we have here in Arizona but that really didn't happen unfortunately it, it it seemed a bit more appealing because it wasn't routine when I was working in pest control it was very routine walk around the house spray say hello goodbye maybe once in a while go inside sure that makes sense so I know you focus pest control now and it's your own thing so breaking up the routine is probably a little bit easier but even still today i'm sure you have those routes that are a little bit monotonous and i'm sure a lot of people listening right now can empathize with you know, waking up in the morning going okay i'm running the same i'm running the same thing i do every day and it does it becomes a little bit of a wear on you what are you what are you doing right now how are you how are you managing that experience with with things being a little bit redundant and pest control. And maybe sometimes I hesitate to use the word boring because I think that we can find excitement in anything, but just how, how do you prevent yourself from falling into that routine and, and not driving the business forward? This is a really good question. I, I've never thought about the question like that, but it's very, when I was doing firearms training, we had a saying complacency kills, but these days it's very different as a business owner. I live for the days where I can just work on autopilot. There are few and far in between because even if I am running a route, there is still so much stuff behind the scenes. There's leads coming in, there's somebody has an issue, and there's just so much stuff to do. But what does help with that is, I would say for me, is two things. One is... I have a different view of these routes now. It's not just a job I clock in, clock out, get through it, go home. It's these are my people. These are the people that trust me to provide them with service and protect their homes. So that's I have a different mindset about it. And it's just I've focused a lot on gratitude. I'm just gonna go off on a tiny tangent right here, but sure. like, there are days where it's tough. And I'm like, this is, maybe I should just stop. And I stop, I take a couple moments and I, I'm so lucky to, I have this band. I'm so lucky I have these tools. I'm so lucky I have these clients that trust me. 
And so it's just a, a different mindset altogether than I had when I was running a route or a pest control company. And, and the other thing that helps is I, I do, I would say I do about 10 to 25% wildlife that breaks up the monotony. I think I said that word right. Yeah, I, I think so. And it sounds like you've got a really excellent mindset about the business and about the way you run things. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds a lot like you view everything as from the perspective of this is an opportunity that I have and not just something that I have to do. Is that right? Yeah. I'm, business is tough. Running a business is one of the toughest things I've done, but I'm in a position, I'm so grateful to be in this position and I'm so grateful, like I can see the path ahead and I'm so grateful for this journey. Yeah, absolutely. I think gra gratitude is definitely key. How, how long have you been in business? About two years. About two years. So I know you, you said something that kind of piqued my curiosity. You said you can see the path ahead. When it comes to growing the business and you're in it for, you're in it for two years now and you've been working in the industry for a while, what are some of the things that you think about in terms of innovating the business and really creating that path ahead? Oh, I want to, when I see the path ahead community, I know a lot of companies are like, oh yeah, our company's family, you're going to sign on as a family. I, I, I don't see it really like that. I don't, I want, I don't want people to sign on with the company and the manager or myself says, welcome to the family. No, we're not a family. We work together, but the company values are going to be, I want them to be so strong within the community that people see Green Arrow as, as a player in the community, as a, somebody that they can trust, somebody that's there for them, that can help. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that really creating and solidifying your brand within the community as a resource and not just a company is, is really a, an interesting way forward. Something I'm curious about, because you said you don't want to, I, I totally hear you when companies say, oh, we're a family, right? That <clears throat> it feels good, but it is almost never yeah. the case, right? It's, it, it never plays out the way I think whoever came up with saying that intends. Correct. When you think about building your team in the years to come, what, what builds a, in your mind and in your processes, what builds a solid team versus someone who just says, Hey, we're a family. So we, we do things together because it sounds like you've got a pretty specific outlook on that. I'm so glad you asked this question. Cause that means that I can say one of my favorite quotes. Carl Jung said, you are what you do, not what you say you will do. And I live by this. I, even before I heard of the quote, I have always lived by this. Um, we've all been around people who say they're going to do a lot and then don't deliver. And it just leaves a bad taste. So in my opinion, when, when somebody gets hired on with a company and they, the company says, yeah, we're like a family here. We treat each other like this and we'll always be there for you. And then. They say that because they want the person to be all excited and, and, and enmeshed in the system. But those things take time. You got the same way that you have to earn people's trust as a company. You have to earn your employees trust to be able to make them feel comfortable. And then there's the whole, like you work for a company, they try to get, and they look at you as just another number on a spreadsheet and they try to get as much out of you before you quit instead of focusing on how can we keep this employee on a long time companies this is the one thing that i hated working for big companies their companies are so focused on like the customer and they forget their technicians and then when they forget their technicians those are the people who are who are in front of the customers every single day. So if a technician is not happy at the company, they're not going to do a good job. They're not going to smile when they reach the customer's door. And that's just going to amount to bad service. 
Yeah, that is an excellent insight and something that I, I think that anyone who listens to this should take note of. And something that is really intriguing to me is you have the exact same outlook outward to the community as you do to your employees. And so holistically, I feel like that all has to come together. You want to give to your employees the way you want your employees to give to the community. You want to be that ingrained sense of a trustworthy resource as much as you want your company to be an ingrained sense of a trustworthy resource. And that's really cool. That definitely pushes yourself, your team to be the best assets for each other and for the community possible. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. I, so I, I have an assistant right now. Mm -hmm. I don't have any technicians, but my goal is to offer a lot of cool benefits for the technicians. I want to, I'm not going to say force them, but I want to make sure that they take a vacation and just really show them, not tell them. I'm not going to, I don't want to tell them, I want to show them that I am on their team, that I'm, that not me, the company is there for them. And I don't think that you would have to force a vacation on anybody. I think that, uh, that, that <laughs> as long and knowing what I know about you, I feel like you'll make people comfortable enough that they're okay with coming to you and saying, Hey, I'm going to take a vacation at this time. Is that cool? And of course it is because we want our people to be relaxed and the, and the best versions of themselves that they can be so they can, there's the reality of it is that we run businesses. And so we need people to perform and people perform best when they feel cared about and relaxed and refreshed and, and they're comfortable in their environment. And I think you're setting your team up to do that very well. Yes, I agree a hundred percent. And there's a study out there somewhere that employees who take vacations actually work better than employees who just work straight throughout the year. Yeah. Yeah. So we've talked a little bit about the path forward and, and what comes next for you. I want to go back in time real quick because I, I I know we got a lot of people who are going to listen to this who are new into the game or maybe are working for a big company and want to start their own thing. What, when you first started out, what were what was your route to to really filling out that first route and getting your book of business growing? When I first started out, what was my route like? Yeah, wow. how did how did you grow that route? What were the what were some of the things that you did to to build up your book of business when you first started out? When I first started out, I I would just post my Facebook feed and I started out with Yelp. I know a lot of people hate Yelp. I gave them a shot and it it panned out for me. I think in Arizona Yelp is pretty good, mm. but I think my first month I actually did like four thousand dollars in business. And, and, um, and, and that was one, that is strong. Yeah, and that is because of a big exclusion job that I did, if mm -hmm. I remember correctly, one or two. It I mean it started strong with the business, I will say that. Just building out a route. I don't know. I, I went about it a little different. I looked at the valley. We it's a very large area and I said, I want to do business in this entire valley. Mm -hmm. So I just I just opened it up and do a lot of driving. I know a lot of people aren't very pro large route. Sure. But I have people everywhere. I don't know. It's working out for me so far. Yeah. I'm happy. That's great. How, how important was, were referrals when you were first starting out? Were you getting a lot of like word of mouth and, Hey, my, my buddy needs this service. Can you go hit him up too? Uh, I think in the beginning, maybe one or two a month that first year, that's, that's all the referrals I was getting. I, I wasn't getting a lot of referrals and I really, the whole thing, letting people know and getting emails that I sent. One area I could have been better was when I knock on the door and finish up with the service, I could have asked them to refer me to three people or something like that. That would have been a stronger move. And I could actually do that now. But referrals didn't really kick in until the second year. This summer, I've gotten like six to 10 referrals a month. And, and that's been incredible. And I'm really excited for what 
the referrals will bring in next year. Oh, absolutely. And it, it does, be, it does become an exponential game too, as your book of business grows and as you grow as an operator and as a technician and as a company owner, the ability to yield those referrals really starts to, to snowball too, which is a great segue into my next question for you here. This is something that uh, I know you've got on your mind and something you're thinking about a lot, and I can't wait to hear your thoughts on it, but it does come in tandem with the referral game. As far as when you are in the field, when you're talking with customers, when you're building up that community, what impact would you say that customer service has on the growth of a business? I would say that customer service is everything. My view of my business is I am not a pest control company. I'm a customer service company that does pest control. I want customer service to be at the forefront of my business. And I try and do everything to make that happen. I will do, you know, if there's a, something that takes five, 10 minutes, I'm helping out. I'm there for them. Say there's a small crack on the side of the house. I'm like, hey man, bugs can enter through this crack. You want me to seal it up for you? I get the yes, I'll seal it up for them. No problem, free of charge, because I'm there for them. I'm their guy. That's my goal. There's, I told you I used to be a locksmith. The other day I was at my clan, she, she was installing new locks and I said, hey, if you need any help, let me know because I used to be a locksmith. I can help you out. And I knock on the door, I'm about to finish the service. And she's like, hey, actually, this, the, I'm trying to install a handle and it's not working. Can you take a look at it? Turns out all it's needed was uh, a drill to widen the hole. I did it for her and she was so happy and it took me two minutes, no time at all. That, that, that like on the service side of things, I'm really trying to be their guy, but also it, it comes down to interact with my clients. When I message them, I don't message them. Hey, this is mayor with green arrow pest solutions. I'm coming for your pest control service. That's super canned, super servicey message them. I'll be like. If I was messaging you, I'd say, hey, Tate, I'm going to be over in about 30 minutes for your pest service. And the reason I don't say who I am and is because I want them to save my number in their shop. I want them and I say, hey, hey, we're friends. That's the same way that I talk with you. Yeah. It's the same way that I talk with my clients. When I'm at their house, I'll le- like, if we're talking, I'll lean against the wall. Because that's what friends do if we're talking with each other. Whenever a lot of people here in Arizona have these metal doors, like security doors. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to knock on those. Plus it's really loud and jarring. But whenever I can, I knock on the door because friends knock on the door. Strangers ring doorbells. I wish I could take credit for that, but I learned that from Tommy Mello of A1 Garage Doors. That, that's an excellent insight. That is really fun. Strangers ring the doorbell. And you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. It's creating that casual environment where people don't feel like they're interacting. Because here's a situation that you run into. And I think anyone who's ever purchased a car has had this experience. The person you are sitting across from that is doing the business with you, the operator for the business, they can either become your best friend or they are just a piece of the business that you forget about when the interaction is done. Yeah. And the more you can push towards being a friend and being casual, and that doesn't necessarily mean being a pushy salesperson or trying so hard that you come off fake, but just being casual and being comfortable. Yeah. It puts people in a position to want to remember you. And that comes back to the thing that you said, which is you want your customers to put you in their phone. That is one of the strongest signals that someone cares. If they have committed you to their phone, you're in, you're good to go. And I love that. Thank you. So as you build out your team moving forward, I know you said you don't have any techs in the field right now. That's a very 
that's a very nuanced skill to have to be able to create that comfortability. Now, is that something that as you're hiring, you think that you'll look for in people? Or is that something that you've got an idea of how you might want to train and teach into people? Or maybe it's a little bit of both. Yeah, it's a little bit of both. So when, there's there's a lot of ways to know somebody's personality. There's a variety of different tests and whatnot. And in my plan, I'm not going to have them sit for three days testing. Sure. That would, yeah, that would just be, I'll just be a pain in the ass. But oh, yeah. My plan is to find the, the best methods to really look. I want to hire for personality, um, doing the work that can be taught. It's really logical. It's pretty straightforward. Very rarely we have to think outside the box. And you know what? I don't care if they have to think outside the box or not, because at the end of the day, that's what a manager is for. You call the manager, Hey, I have a problem. Let's fix it. So I really want to focus on just have one of the best training procedures for for my business for pest control for i i was talking to a buddy of mine and he was saying man it's gonna take me a month to to get my technician this is for wildlife a month to get my technician into the field and then fully trained it's gonna take i don't he was saying somewhere around three months and I, well, let's get on the next slide. Hey, just good for thought. What if you committed to one month straight training, every possible scenario, not learning on the job, not learning on the road, and you can build your own like training procedure in house and go through every scenario possible? Wouldn't that get your tick wouldn't that make your technician more trained and get them on the road faster making you more money so take a step back to move two steps forward yeah i i think that you're absolutely right there and something that and i'm curious to get your thoughts on this because something i've heard speaking with operators and this is maybe more so on the wildlife side because there's a little bit more surprise and delight that you might find and the wildlife oh, yeah. side, you end up in, in an attic and think you're dealing with one thing. And now all of a sudden you've got chewed wires and torn up insulation. And now you're trying to figure out, okay, how are we correcting this whole issue? I actually, I, I just spoke with someone not too long ago who had the, the opposite school of thought. And they said that to have a wildlife operator in a position of, of success, it might be two or three years before they know everything they need to know. And that shocked me. And I think that for a certain business model that might be correct, where you might not feel a hundred percent comfortable putting someone in the field for a couple of years while they learn all of the, the potential surprises that they may run into. But it sounds to me, going back to something you said earlier about, about creating an environment where people feel comfortable in your company, that you aren't as worried about whether or not someone has run into every single possible issue because you want people to feel comfortable enough to be able to come to their leaders in the organization and say, Hey, I'm dealing with this. How do I approach this? Is that right? Yeah. So that is very correct. And I wouldn't be upset if I had a technician who I post in the Nicola chatter group all the time. I'm, you know, I'm constantly running into things or trying to, that I haven't seen or trying to make things just streamline my operation. I'm constantly posting. I wouldn't be upset if I had a technician who, who posted into the groups looking for information because there are so many incredibly smart operators out there and who have seen so much more than me, so much more than I will probably ever see. And I agree with that sentiment that it, it'll take about three years for somebody to be fully trained. There's so much. And even when, once you learn it, you have to perfect it. I just took a, a metal bending course with Wild Man Mark. Yeah. The Get Bent Academy. I love the name of that, by the way. I, he, yeah. His branding for that is fantastic. It's spot on. It's spot on. And it fits his personality. Great dude. Oh, yeah. 
you know, I, I was in the course and I was like, okay, this course is about the concepts. And now I need to either do a whole bunch of jobs and learn on the jobs or create a mock-up and do it over and over until I understand it. And then I can do it really good in the field. Yeah. So I agree with that. It's going to take a lot of time to train somebody to be, especially for a wildlife technician, to be really good. But you can eliminate a lot of the the risk of sending a, a, a lesser trained employee out into the field just by creating that comfortable environment where they can come to their, I, I hesitate to use the word superior, the person above them in the chain of the business. Creating yeah. a comfortable flow of knowledge both up and down is so important. I agree with that. And I, I also, I believe that I, I was never a fan of training on the job. Think about it like this. I served in the Israeli Defense Forces. We did uh, seven months of training before we even did any active duty. And think about it. Imagine if they had given us month or even let's give it three months of basic training. And then they were like, hey, man, you guys are going to go to protect this area or you guys are going to go to to do an operation we're going to teach you on the job mm -hmm. we would have failed oh, yeah. and so we did seven months of training for three years of active duty so that i think taking one step back so you could take two steps forward in my opinion that's a it's a more upfront cost but it will eliminate frustration and potentially some serious mishaps in the field. Sure. It makes it feel like a slow start, but it puts you in a position of, you know, what's three months for a year of positive effort, right? You take a couple of months and sure, you don't get the benefit of this person being in the field and the, the time and the freedom that creates within your, your workflow. But what you do get is the confidence that a year from today, things are going to be smooth and you're not going to have to worry about nearly as many callbacks, nearly as many negative reviews. Client or employee retention is going to be a lot higher in that case too, because you don't have to worry about people failing in the field if they are trained well enough and feel comfortable enough to come to you to address situations accordingly. Yeah. And I, I will say this for, I know a lot of wildlife businesses are small mm -hmm. and so when I worked at uh, one of the large companies, they had an uh, in-house trainer who would basically be in charge of all the training for new hires, for current hires, or, and then just out in the field. And he would shadow us as well. Uh, I know a lot of companies aren't big enough to, to, uh, to hire somebody like that, but I think about this constantly because I'm a small company and a. I think of it, trying to think of a solution constantly of like, how can I have somebody who would do a month to three months of, of hands-on training with a new employee, but I'm not hiring all the time. Sure. So what are they going to do the rest of the time? It's just, it's something that I am trying to find a solution for all the time. Yeah. Absolutely. And pursuing solutions to those types of problems is as the business owner and as the principal operator, that's your core focus is how do we streamline? How do we improve? You know, obviously you're, you're two years in, which uh, congratulations on, 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 on making it to a, a two year mark. I know a lot of people, I know a lot of people that don't, and I know a lot of people that uh, get to get to a year and go, Ooh, I don't know if I'm cut out for this, but it sounds like you've doubled down and made this your commitment, which is excellent. What is uh, what something, that. of course, what's something that you see happening with, whether it's with competitors or with, with colleagues in the industry, what's something that you feel pest control operators get wrong most frequently when running their business? I feel like people get wrong. Interesting. I, I haven't really thought about it in like that frame. I don't know. I have a lot of pest control operators here in Arizona. I'm in a group. We're, we're in a group together. I hang out with a bunch of them. Try and every so often meet with a pest control operator or a business owner 
or for lunch or something like that. Mm -hmm. Strengthen my relationships with them. Honest, I wish I had an answer for that, but I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. The funny thing is, and I respect that answer, but in a way you did give me an answer too, which is that, that you're meeting with a lot of these guys and you're sitting down. And to me, it sounds like you're learning from other people in the industry. And it almost seems like maybe that might be the underlying answer there is that more people should be doing things like that. I would love to see that happen. Because the different Facebook groups with the owners are nice. People can connect and talk with each other and learn from each other. And it's just small businesses rooting for one another. There's more than enough business to go around. Most of us don't live in like tiny rural communities with 20,000 people. Sure. Even with 20,000 people, I think there's enough to go around. Um, so... I want to see more of small business owners helping each other out, rooting for one another, supporting each other. But yeah, you're absolutely right. And just as an observation from my time in the pest and wildlife communities, it really is amazing how supportive and how interactive all of the business owners are. And, and he, there's, there's so many situations where, uh, and I'm talking to a potential client of mine, and for clarification, because this has not been discussed, I, I run an agency that services pest control and wildlife companies. There's situations where I talk to potential clients and they're in conflict with someone that we have already because we protect our clients' territories. And right. I'll say, oh, I, I'm sorry, I appreciate you reaching out, but we can't work together. I've got someone in the next in the next city over, but it's close enough that it'll create a conflict. And the person I'm talking to is going, oh, is it Jim? Is it? Fred? Is it Frank? Is it Lisa? Is it one of the, because they all know each other. Everybody knows yeah. each other and they're all cool with each other, which I think is just amazing. Amazing to have that kind of community and support within an industry. Yeah. It's really powerful to have that support. Yeah. And Nikoa does a great job at promoting this. I've taken a couple of their courses and spoken to a lot of the board members and they really emphasize creating strategic partnerships. One of my strongest strategic partnerships, great dude, Nick Massimo, the snake guru in Arizona or Phoenix, mm -hmm. great dude. I've called him up and been like, Hey man, I got this, this situation. What are your thoughts on it? And he didn't tell me his thoughts. He was, he said, Hey, I'll be over in 30 minutes to help you out. Yeah. So it, just incredible networking opportunities, like within the pest control community. Yeah. Just getting to know the people who, I, I always say it like this, get to know the people who know more than you do. Yes. And, uh, and if you can do that, then all of the knowledge that they have can flow to you as well. As we wrap up here, I have one, one last question for you that I'd love to, to get your thoughts on. What? If you were to speak to someone who's just starting, so if someone came to you because they saw you as the source of the knowledge that they wanted to learn from, what's something you would tell someone who's just starting out in the pest control industry? What's, whether it's a heads up, something philosophical, something tactical, what's, where does your mind go? It goes to this. I'm two years in. I have almost 200 clients. I think that's great. I think that's incredible. I've been on a constant upwards growth from the beginning. But too many times, the loudest stories are the people who they put on 200 clients in, in two weeks. And I'm not knocking that with the right resources, the right. I'm not saying it's a unicorn, but some people can do it and some people can't. Too many times we're looking at, at businesses, especially when we first start, we're looking at businesses that are strong and already established and or people who are making moves with a, a lot of i'll call it power and money and it's not something that a small new business can relate to i would focus on just my my advice would be to find people who are in or can relate to the situation that you're in because i remember posting in the the, the Facebook groups, hey, hey, I want to get more leads. How do you do it? And so many people would be like, it's just referrals. Okay. 
we need to know how long you've been in business for. Oh, you've been in business for five, 10 years. Yeah. That makes sense that you're just doing referrals. Yeah. In short, my advice would be to find people who are at the same stage of business and get advice from them, but also you also want to learn from the successful people. Don't compare yourself to them. Sure. They are in a different level. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think that's excellent advice. Mayor, I appreciate you again, taking the time to, to do this podcast today and, and speak to your experience in the pest control world. Before, before we get off, is there anything else that you would like to, to mention, like to talk about that you feel people in the industry may find helpful? I'm going to say something and it's, it might be a little crazy, but my, I have this like little vision I want to connect with, I'm young, I'm mm -hmm. 29 years old yeah. and I think it would be awesome to connect with people on Fortnite. I play a lot of Fortnite. I love the game and I want to talk business with people while playing Fortnite. If anybody wants to connect with me, my handle is M-E-R-H and then the number's 21. I, I certainly just, just sent you a request on Epic. The next podcast we do together, <laughs> it's happening as we drop out of the battle bus. Listen, I think that would be a fantastic way to do our next episode. Let's run it on and let's run it on some duos. Let's I might do have, it. I might have to go zero build because I have not played in a while. So I'll be a little rusty on the build side, but listen, I think we can make it happen. Uh, Hell yeah. Mayor, again, I appreciate you taking the time to do this today. It has been a blast. Mayor Ginsburg with Green Arrow Pest Solutions, everybody out in Phoenix, Arizona. If you're listening to this, you've got a pest problem and you're in Phoenix, give Mayor a call. He'll help you out. Thank you very much. Thank you.